Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. Today I'm joined by Mr. Aaron Blaze, former Disney animator. Aaron, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Finally. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> finally, right, man? Uh, for the fans out there, it's taken a couple months, man. Uh, some shit's happened, some crazy shit, some good shit, some bad shit. So nonetheless, yeah. we're here. Uh, Aaron, I got to say, man, what is it like looking back? Now, how long have you been out of the, uh, the Disney animation game at this point? I, I left Disney in 2010, so it's been it's been 12 years. It's been a long time. It's been well, it's been half the length that I was there. So I was there for 21 years. When you think back now, obviously you guys were were really kicking up a serious pace when you were there. You guys were out here yeah. in the uh, the Florida Animation Studios over here at uh, what was it, Disney MGM, Walt yep. Disney Studios, right? So yeah, before it was uh, Hollywood Studios, yeah, yeah. So. When you sit back, like I said, you guys are kicking it hot and heavy, so you don't really have time to appreciate, most people don't, when it's going on. But whenever you're not doing, you have time to reflect and time to like reminisce. So what's it like when somebody refers to you as a huge part of the Disney renaissance and bringing back classic animation with Disney? What does that feel like to you? It's super cool because, you know, when we started, we used to look at the nine old men and say, man, look at what they've done. And... And, uh, and there was, you know, there, we had nothing to compare it to. So to us, it was just this, this thing that they did that was so magical, and, but we had nothing to gauge against it. And then we started, you know, I, I, I came into Disney in 1988 uh, as an intern, and I was there from 88 until 2010. So all through the, 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 the resurgence and the renaissance or whatever the hell you want to call it. And... Um, and you know when we first, when we hit like Little Mermaid and it was such a big hit, a relative big hit. I mean, when you compare it to the other hits that came afterwards, Mermaid was just an eighty-six million dollar movie. But at the time, it was the biggest animated film of all time, and everyone was like, "Holy cow, man, this is amazing!" And then um, then we had a little dip with Rescuers Down Under, which is still I thought a great movie, but it just didn't hit. But then. Uh, Beauty and the Beast came along and first of all working on Beauty and the Beast that's the thing you know I was 22 21 or 22 years old and um, <laughs> yeah and I was working with Glenn Keane Glenn Keane was my mentor he taught me animation and uh, for those of you that don't know Glenn Keane he's probably one of the best contemporary animators in the world right now and um, and he was just such a big part of my life in the early days inspiring me and teaching me and so he brought me on to animate Beast with him, along with four other guys. And so that whole experience in itself was amazing. But then for the movie to go on and become as big as it was. But once again, we were seeing it through, you know, we'd never experienced anything like it before. So we really didn't know. It's like, oh, yeah, this movie's doing really great. You know, that's cool. And then we went and we just did another. We kind of got used to it at the risk of sounding kind of like an asshole about it. We kind of got used to you know, making hits. We did Aladdin after that. And then we did uh, the Lion King after that. And then Pocahontas and Mulan. And it, and it just, it was, it was movie after movie. And, and, and then all of a sudden after about 10 years of this, and then another generation started coming up, we started realizing, oh man, we're, we're becoming the nine old men from the, or not the nine, it was like a whole studio now, yeah. but from the, from the early days, I mean, obviously we're riding on the shoulders of those guys and we could never compare it. I don't want to sound too big headed, but it was just we we're creating a whole new legacy. And what's really cool now is being able to go anywhere in the world. I just spent uh, not just I was about three years ago. I spent uh, a month in China kind of touring all over China teaching. And it didn't matter where I went. Every kid knew the Lion King and knew, you know, especially Mulan. Yeah. But, you know, knew all the, you know, Beauty and the Beast. They knew all the classics. And some of these kids were, you know, five, six years old. So it just doesn't go away. It's, it's, it's embedded in not just our own culture here in the States, but world culture. It's amazing. It really is, man. And, and, and just to sit there and reflect, I mean, five, six years old. We got a seven. No, he's eight months old now. We got an eight month old and I got a 12 year old, man. We really, uh, really wanted to start over, I guess, is what you're getting at, right? So with the eight-month-old, like every night now, we've uh, after we get out of work and we eat dinner and stuff like that, we'll sit on the couch for a little while and we'll pop in a Disney movie. And I started with going just all the way back to, I think Pinocchio is where we started. And then, right. or, yeah, Pinocchio. So, and just watching everything, right? My favorite Disney movie has always been The Jungle Book. I love that movie. The movie is so yeah. beautiful. Um, 
but uh, I noticed like the eight month old, he'll sit there and he'll watch for a second and he'll, he'll go away and he'll watch for a second, a little bit longer and it goes away. And then he comes back and I was watching, we were watching Wally the other night and he's just sitting there dumbfounded drool. I mean, he's a baby. So it really <laughs> drool is just coming down his face and he's just, yeah, right. right. So it, it's, yeah. there's something about those Disney movies. It's that heart, it's that soul that everybody that you guys put in there, man. So it's, what's, what's cool about it is, I mean, how old were you in 1993, 94? Four. I was born in 89. Okay. Well, there you go. You're born the year I started. So, you know, the, as we got into, um, you know, some of the films later in the nineties, you're, you're the, you grew up on this, on this stuff now, and now you're giving it to your next generation, which is amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, my, my daughter, my daughter was born in 89 as well. And, uh, and I, and I always joke about, um, she had a very special way of growing up because she grew up in the studio. And, yeah. and uh, when I was designing Nala for the Lion King, I did young Nala. And I was really inspired by her eyes. She had these big eyes, my daughter. And so my daughter's 32. And she still tells everybody that, you know, she's the inspiration for Nala. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. But yeah, so you, I mean, you, you're, you're the target audience. Is she getting a residual check? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, animators don't get residuals. The actors do, but that's always been a big bone of contention in Hollywood. Man, that's some bullshit. Hopefully with this new deal that the animators are trying to work out, man, you guys can actually get some kind of residuals. Because if it wasn't for you guys, man, there'd be nothing to really voice. You need all yeah. the pieces, but you guys are seventy percent of the issue, or not? Yeah, the it's um, it won't happen. But it's it's a nice way of thinking. Of, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, we we had pretty decent salaries. I mean, the actors, the voice actors, don't get paid monetarily as much as people think. Yeah. They get paid okay, but then they make their money through the residual stuff. Um, and then you know we get paid, or at least you know when we were working at Disney, I was getting paid a yearly salary. I wasn't getting paid project to project. So I was getting paid whether we had work or not. So they always took really good care of us. I have, you know, I have no complaints at all. That's good, man. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Cause you always hear the pitfalls and the traps of, of, of this industry. Well, a lot of industries. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, you know, I almost think it's the thing to, you know, to knock, you know, cause they're big, they're big, you know, huge companies and, and, uh, and big evil, whatever, you know, and it's just, it becomes the thing to do, but you know, I really, I never had, I mean, I, I can complain about this or that, but overall I never had a bad, a bad day at Disney. It was, it was pretty amazing. That's really cool, man. Not a lot of people can say that about any industry or any job. So yeah. you get to work for the biggest one in the animation industry is, is something cool to hear. Now, some of those movies you just, uh, you just mentioned, like we just talked Beauty and the Beast and Lion King. Out of all of those movies, you personally, not which one do you think is your favorite, but which one do you think had the most cultural impact as far as just name recognition and just which one do you think was the best one, I guess is what I'm getting at. Well, other than the, you know, Frozen right now, but going back to the other ones, I would say, I'd have to say a toss up between Lion King and Pocahontas. I think Pocahontas had a really big cultural impact in the 90s. Um, but Lion King was so huge. I mean, everybody had a... I don't know. Shit, no, it's hard to say because Aladdin was really big too. I mean, every, every little girl had a Jasmine, and um, yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I just will. I'm, I'm wilting. Uh, What's it like being the hot chick at that point? Because that's what you guys are at this point. You just you said it yourself. Everything was a hit, 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 hit for ten plus years, man. What was that like? What was that feeling like? Was it was a rush? It it was. It was. It, well, it, it was great and it was bad at the same time because then you start thinking, well, shit, I mean, we can do anything and we can't we can't do anything wrong. And so it wasn't until things started to drop that we realized, oh man, that you know we can be foul, you know, we can put out some bad stuff. And we were putting out some bad stuff. And that's when, you know, when the studio started going down downhill and uh, you know, here in Florida, we lost, you know, the studio was here for 15 years. Yeah. I was actually one of the first guys hired at the studio, and I was the last one to walk out the door. I was there longer than anybody. And um, and it was heartbreaking when that studio went under. It was 300 and so almost 400 people that worked at that studio. We started out, we were just 75. Um, but we got to a point where I think the formula, and I hate to call it a formula because we don't make these movies as a formula, yeah. but there was this musical. Broadway formula in the way we made our films through the 90s. And I think it just became a little bit of a crutch. And, a, and I, think the, I think the audiences just got, oh, okay, another musical, you know, got a little tired of it. And, um, and I think Disney was a little afraid to 
go in a different direction. Um, and, you know, they wanted to stick to what was working until it didn't. And then when it didn't, they didn't have a backup plan. And so that's what happened with the studio in Florida. Um, they really didn't have anything new in development that could carry the studio. And, um, and when, you know, that the, from a financial standpoint, everybody at the studio here in Florida was, uh, was under contract. So we, well, not under contract, but we were all, we weren't project to project. We were studio based. And so we're burning it. You know, the studio itself burns, it burns about a million dollars a week just in salaries. Um, and if you don't have a project to work on that, you're burning a million dollars a week, literally you're burning it. And so, um, and that's what happened. The company said, uh, they, let's get, let's downsize, bring it all back to Los Angeles and, and uh, reassess. And so that's what happened. And, and, uh, but all came, but I think it came out of just us, you know, Disney will say that, uh, you know, 2D animated films weren't selling as well, and this and that. But I think it really did come down to just kind of, we just kind of got into a, a, a rut and just didn't have, I think our stories weren't that great. We could have done better. And, um, and I think we could have just broken the mold a little bit more. Looking back now with, you know, hindsight always being 2020. Do you guys, do you, can you pick out a point in time where you started to see that, that decline, like you were saying, like you guys didn't really have anything worthwhile saying or. It was right after we did brother bear. I mean, I, brother bear was a big struggle for us and uh, I had never done a film before. I'd never directed a film before. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big struggle for me as a first time director. And, uh, um, but then, you know, I was always so used to seeing what was in development after the current project or the current project being what, what we were doing. And there wasn't anything there. There was one called My Peoples, which was going to be directed by uh, Barry Cook. Mm -hmm. um, but they're basically putting all their eggs in one basket. And it was a very, very, this is one where I thought it could have been really great because it really was breaking the mold. Um, but it was an Appalachian story, um, very, very far from Hollywood, yeah. put it that way. And I don't think a lot of the executives, especially the current executives at the time, who I wasn't a big fan of, fans of, um, I don't think they got it. They just didn't get it. And so they, they can't, they, when the time came to put it into production or green light it, they canned it. And so once that happened, um, there was nothing, we, we had nothing in the, in the hopper to, to backfill it. And so that was, that was the beginning of the end for the Florida studio. So once once uh, Brother Bear was released, there was nothing else after that. So with that one being your hardest time, you said, and then you were directing that one, what were some of the, I don't want to say pitfalls, but what were some of the things walking into those director's shoes that that you might not have expected? And there's a lot of there's a lot of people that listen to this that are in the animation industry. Yeah. That might try chasing that 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 goal as being a director. So you being that first time director and walking into it for Brother Bear, man, what would be some of the advice you'd go back in time and give yourself if you could? Well, one of the things is, you know, just to back up from that question, you know, one of the biggest questions I get from young people, first of all, you know, we, we become such a society of instant gratification, right? You know, whether it's, you know, I call it the American Idol generation. It's instant stardom on American Idol. And, and, you know, it's instant information on your phone. It's instant this, instant that. And the one thing you can't have instantly is a craft like I, I hate using the word craft, but it's it's a trade. It's a whatever you want to call it, the of filmmaking and storytelling and animation. It takes, you know, 10,000 hours chunk of your lifetime to, to hone and, and develop. And one of the big questions I get from 18 year old, you know, first year animation students is how do I become a director? And and. I tell them you, you just you got to get into the industry and you got to get knocked down and you got to learn and you got you know there's the school can only teach you so much but it, it's ninety percent of what I what I learned I learned from you know getting into Disney and and you know getting my hands dirty um, and you know when I became an animator I had been a supervising animator for several films and so um, I think I'd made like six years I've been part of making six or seven movies at that point. And after Mulan, um, the studios, uh, the head of the studio used to do this big state of the studio address. Yeah. And then we do a video conference and, and we, had, we had the Paris studio at the time. So we had Paris and we had LA and we had Florida. We'd all get hooked up 
on a video conference and uh, Peter Schneider and Tom Schumacher, who are the heads of the studio, would get up on the stage and, and tell us, you know, this is what's in, uh, in development. This is what's in pre-production. Here's what's in production. And so they started talking about development first. And they one of the first things they said was, hey, we've got this movie called Bears in development. And my ears just went, whoop. You know, I just instantly got really excited. I didn't hear anything else because, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was all about animals and animating animals and drawing and and, uh, and so, you know, the idea of being able to draw and animate bears, I just thought would be amazing. And so um, uh, we got started, well, they, they finished up the conversation and uh, they, um, I, I, mean, I hope I'm not going off of your, your question. Oh, no, uh, keep going. But, um, what's that? I said, keep going, I love it. Yeah, so, um, uh, so, Anyway, they, uh, I, I contacted Tom Schumacher right afterwards and said, hey, oh, I remember where, where I was going with this. OK, sorry. Sometimes I'll ramble on. So I, <laughs> I got really I got really excited and said, hey, I'd love to be a part of this. You know, I'd love to art direct it or, or you know, supervise the animation, character design, whatever you got. And at the time, they really didn't have anything, uh, anybody working on it. It was kind of stalled out. But I, kept, I just kept pounding at the door until finally, after a few weeks, uh, Schumacher came and saw me at my office. and, and uh, and he said, hey, you know, we don't have anybody working on it. If you want to work on it, you're more than welcome to. And, and uh, have you ever thought about directing? And I hadn't. I was like, direct, direct a movie? No, I, I'm an animator. I, I, don't, I don't do the big picture thing. And, uh, and I was stunned. I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. And I, and I didn't know. All of a sudden, I, had, I was given this opportunity. And uh, he said, well, go think about it. And I remember going home and talking to my wife, Karen, and... Uh, and I called my stepfather, who was always a big part of my life, and called him up and, and uh, talked to him about it. I was 28 or 29 at the time. And, and um, so I'm still early in my career. And I, I, could, I could keep going as, as a supervising animator and everything would be fine. I could have a great, a great opportunity there, a great career doing that. Um, but, or I could take this big risk as a, as a director, uh, but I might mess it up. Every movie that I'd been on, every film that I'd been on up to that point, the first director had gotten fired and they bring on another director. <laughs> and so I, I didn't want to be the first director, but I also had this voice in the back of my head saying, Hey, you know, what happens if you don't do it? You're always going to wonder what if. So I decided to, to take the chance to do it. And, um, the thing was, the, the Here's the long way, you know, the long route of getting here. I didn't know what I didn't know. I I had made several movies, and it's like, yeah, I know how to make a movie. I've done it six or seven times. I made the production part of it. I never had anything to do with developing and and, and doing pre-production, writing a story, understanding structure, you know, all of that stuff, writing character, you know, all that stuff had already been done for me when I came onto a film, and so now all of a sudden I was responsible for it, and I had no idea how to do it. And I had to have, and I had a crew of people that were looking to me to, to create that. Well, then the other, the other big thing I learned along the way is that you don't have to have all the answers as a director. You just have to have the right people that are going to find the answers for you and you let your crew, you know, do what they need to do and you just steer the way. And, uh, but all these things developed as I went. And, and I always talk about Brother Bear being my six year, because it took six years to make, it was my six year filmmaking class. And, um, and by the time we finished the movie, I was ready to make a movie, you know, but, um, but it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And, and I, I swore every day I woke up, you know, so not every day, but there were days I swore I'd never, I'd never make another movie again. There were days I didn't want to go to work. I, you know, I just, you know, maybe I could call in sick, you know, it's just, it's just tough. It was really hard. And um, you're given this huge responsibility and, and, and you doubt yourself every day, you know, and it's just, it's a, it was a, it was a really tough thing to do, but we got through it, you know? And, uh, and like I said, I learned a lot and the biggest part was, you know, understanding how to write and understand how to, how to build a story. And, um, but it was great, you know, when it finally came out and you get to see it in the theater and you see people react to it. And I still have people come up to me saying, Hey, it's my, you know, my favorite film as a kid. And so all those things are really, you know, it, it makes you want to go back and do it again. They compare it to, uh, like pregnancy, you know, you, you, your wife, yeah. you know, right at the at, at ninth month says, you know, I'm never doing this again. Then you have that sweet little baby. And then it's like, you know, let's, let's go make another one. Yeah. So that's kind of like, that's what making a movie is like. 
So now with you putting those director shoes on and you said your mentor, the guy you looked up to, Glenn Keane, one of the best animators and directors of all time. Yeah. How often were you in his ear saying, Hey man, did you feel like you had imposter syndrome? That word comes up all the time. Did you feel like you had every, imposter syndrome? Every day. Yeah. Especially as a director. I felt so out of my element, out of my class, out of, I was like, every day they picked the wrong guy. They picked them. Why did they offer it to me? Why did I say I was going to do it? I mean, every day. My The thing that really benefited me, and there would be people, I don't know if you've interviewed, there'd be people that'll badmouth the heads of the studio, you know, Tom Schumacher and Peter, and, uh, uh, Peter Schneider, Tom Schumacher, Pam Coates was a producer. Um, she was a head of development. They're the ones that gave me the opportunity to become a director. And I'll got to tell you, every time I hit a bump, didn't know what to do, didn't know to turn left or right, they always had my back. They always gave me a safety net. They knew I was in, I was going to come out better than I went in. And they were just willing to take me through the journey and let me grow. And they really, they were the best bosses I could ever have. Because, you know, I remember Tom He's so patient. I remember uh, we had a big screening. You know, we would we would storyboard the movies, the movie. This is what we do in every film. You get it storyboarded, then you go and screen it, and um, and then you get notes and whatever is good in the movie will go into production. Whatever is bad, and you'll get rewrite it and reboard it, and, and you just keep remaking the movie until it's good. And um, and I think it was on our third screening or something, and and we wanted to try something new and. And we've been, you know, one of the things I've been accused of is not listening to my story crew enough. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to listen to everybody this time. And so I listened to everybody. I put everything into the movie, which was a complete mistake. But I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. And I'm listening and let's see what we come up with. And I remember watching that film and just curling up under my chair, you know, or wanting to. And, and this is in front of the entire studio, you, you know, when you do these screenings and then everybody goes away. And Tom Schumacher, the head of the studio, plus the story crew, you know, everybody sits and you get your notes. And I remember Tom waiting for everybody to leave the, 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 the theater. And he goes, OK, is everyone gone? Yep. OK, guys, now we know what we don't want to do. That's what that's how he started the conversation, you know. And so but that's but that he was seeing, he was starting with positive. At least now we know what we don't want to do. You've solved that. Now let's get into what we do want to do. And so that's what they were to me the whole six years of making this movie. And, you know, I've heard so many people because they're executives and they're the head of the studio, bad mouth them in this way or that way. I can never, I can never do it because they, they just were so supportive and so uh, willing to let the process be the process, knowing that it's going to be a rough journey, but you're going to get there in the end and, and they let it happen. Thank you for sharing that, man. There's one thing I wanted to circle back on. You said you were 27 when you started that that movie? Yeah, uh, 20, 27. I, th I think it was 28, actually, 28. Okay. Still, rel that's that's still <laughs> ridiculously young to direct a movie, especially yeah. movie, right? And the only reason I bring that up, and I want, like I said, I want to circle back to the story where you said that you opened it up to everybody's input type of thing, and then you found out you couldn't do that shit. I've heard that one other time and i don't know if you know him he uh he's cartoon network uh did some nickelodeon disney stuff uh, randy myers he's an animation director worked a lot on um you know samurai jack powerpuff Girls. Yeah, i know i know his name i know his work i don't know him well he animated on uh one of probably my favorite animated movie of all time the iron giant right he was one yeah. of the animators on that and uh brad bird being the director of that you know, incredibles incredibles 2 and quite a few other things ratatouille my favorite pixar movie um he said that Brad had the same thing. Like he had opened it up. He was like, he didn't care if it was a janitor. He didn't care if it was guy in craft services. I can't right. remember if he had a specific day, but he said specific day people could pitch ideas and pitch stuff. And he would listen to them. He'd write them right. down. And then if it made sense, they would do it. If it didn't make sense, he would tell you why it didn't make sense and why it right. would, that he wouldn't just blow it off. So that's right. very, I don't want to say clairvoyant, but that's very, very smart of you to do at such a young age because I don't know about you, but me specifically, I mean, I'm still a pain in the ass, but I've got a very like, oh man, we got to do it this way, this way, this way, this way. And then I, I start to think about it. I'm like, man, my way isn't always the right way. Maybe right. somebody else is seeing something, you know, they say two eyes are better than one or two heads are better than one, whatever the fuck that expression yeah. is. Um, you know, so just seeing that at such a young age, I mean, that's, that's something that 
I would rest the laurels on, man. I'd, I'd tip my hat to it type of thing. I, get, I had good partners, too. I, you know, Bob Walker being my co-director and Chuck Williams being a producer. And we, we made sure he was a creative producer. So he was always part of all that. And, you know, it grew. I mean, we, we got better at it. We practiced at it. And, and, and to this day, I mean, and through the rest of the film, we, we, you know, we had this policy of meet us there, beat us there. Mm-hmm. And what that means is, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what we've written. This is why we wrote it. And I could, should be able to, you know, I would tell you why we wrote it this way. This is why we have this shot in the film. This is why we have the sequence in the film. This is why, you know, you should be able to explain everything. And, um, and as long as they understood where we're trying to go with it and the journey and the, the, the thematic that we're trying to get across, then if you have a better idea, we're more than willing to listen to it. And that, that went across the board to anybody. And, and it's like you said, you know, with, with, uh, um, with, with Iron Giant, you know, if, if, if it was something that we couldn't take, I would explain why and why it didn't line up or at least, in the, and, but that person was able to debate back. And sometimes I would hear the idea in a different way and go, oh, shit, I didn't think of it that way, you know, and then, you know, we would go and maybe reassess. But um, it definitely, you know, after that bad experience of taking in every idea, yeah. it definitely, you know, we the pendulum swung back and forth until it finally settled and we got a nice system going. Beautiful. Um, now, there's a few things, like I said, we're going to bounce all over the place because you've had such a vast career, man, uh, yeah. you know. I'm going to list a couple couple movies off here and whichever one you want to talk about, we'll talk about. So let's let's go. We said Lion King, Mulan, and of course, uh, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. Right. And you had you said The Rescuers and Brother Bear. Now, we did some Brother Bear talk there, but out of those yeah. movies, it isn't Brother Bear. Which one do you think you had the most fun on? I would say the, the two. Well, actually, even more than the two, the one would be Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. I had a great time on on Lion King, uh, you know, because I had Nala, but I didn't really have as much animation with Nala uh, as I did with Beauty and the Beast. Glenn King, working with Glenn, one of the great things about Glenn is that um, he doesn't hold every shot dear, and he's such a generous uh, animator and and teacher, and you know, generous with his knowledge, but also generous with up and coming animators and giving them the shots that are going to help them develop their careers. There's animators, supervising animators out there that won't do that. They'll keep the big juicy shots for themselves yeah. for, you know, whether they, you know, because they don't think anyone can do it as well, or they don't want to risk it, or they want the accolades, whatever. Um, but Glenn, he was never like that. And, and I remember I was, you know, I, I, barely become an animator at that point. I worked on Rescuers Down Under, but I was more of a junior animator. And I worked on um, Roller Coaster Rabbit, which was a, a Roger Rabbit animated short. And that's where I got promoted to animator. So I had very few shots on there. So I really didn't have that much under my belt. And, uh, and so Glenn decided to give me this sequence early on in the film um, where uh, the beast and bell are fighting in front of the fire. He's just been injured by the wolves after she tried to escape and she's trying to bandage him and he, oh, that hurts and, you know, back and forth and they're yelling and arguing and it's just this big juicy acting sequence. And um, it's only about a minute and a half, but it's a nice chunk of animation. And, uh, and so he wanted me to animate that. And I remember going through it going, Oh my God, how I don't know what I'm going to do, and um, but we just took it one step at a time, and uh, I remember flying out to California. It was I, I missed my son's first birthday because of this, but um, but we went out. I went out to California, and uh, and I sat with Glenn for three weeks, and all I did was thumbnail. That's all I did. We just sat there and figured out the choreography, the emotion, the acting of the entire sequence. I did thousands and thousands of little sketches and strung them all together. And after three weeks, I had the whole thing figured out so that I could go back to Florida and, and animate. And you guys got to, the people listening, you know, you got to re- realize how it was done back then, you know, with long distance. You know, we didn't have video conferencing. We didn't have, uh, barely had faxing. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely, you couldn't fax anything that, of a drawing and that didn't work that way. 
And so what we would do, you know, over long distance is if I was working with Glenn and I had a shot, I wanted him to see, I would animate, I do a rough animation of the shot and then I would shoot it on three quarter inch tape. And then I would take the tape and my drawings and put them in a FedEx box and send them across the country and they would go overnight and it would be a two day turnaround. So while that's gone, I'd have to pull out another shot and get working on that and then get that done and send that out. Once that's out, then I'm getting information on the shot I sent out the day before. This is how we made the whole movie. And so um, it, it was insane. And, uh, uh, but it worked. And so anyway, I, thumb, I thumbnailed that whole sequence and came back to Florida and started animating with Mark Hen. Mark Hen, who's also just an amazing animator, has done pretty much every princess <laughs> through the 90s. Um, he was animating Bell through the sequence and I was animating Beast. And so we would go back and forth. And uh, every pass that I'd finish, I'd pack up my drawings and send them out to Glenn and he would draw over them and we'd have a phone conversation and he'd, he'd say, you know, do this and think about it more like that. And and I just worked my way through. And, and I think it took about three months to animate the whole thing. Yeah. And I uh, finally got it done and the directors loved it. And Several people mistook it for Glenn's work, which really put a feather in my cap. I love that. And uh, But the biggest thing for me was how much I grew out of that experience, how much my animation grew, the the way I looked at animation, the way I approached it. You know, Just the idea of taking something that seemed so far outside my abilities and impossible and just knowing that you just got to start at the bottom and start chiseling and you can come out on top. That was the biggest thing I learned on that. And uh, and I tried, that's one of the biggest things I try to teach now with animation is no matter how complex or difficult or whatever, if you just break it down and start looking at it from logical points of view, you can you can get through your shots. And, uh, and it really affected my entire career after that. Um, that was a big part of my reel at the end of the movie. I, had a, I ended up doing a whole bunch of stuff on Beauty and the Beast. Um, you know, there's something there that wasn't there before that whole song out in the snow with the birds and then the stuff up in the dungeon and all kinds of stuff. But that one sequence really stood out as the as the best part of my reel. And, and that's what got me my my characters later on. Ron Clements and John Musker saw the reel and, and you know, they gave me my own character after that. So it just it opened up so many doors for my whole career after. That's really cool, man. It's uh, awesome. When. When you're doing this, obviously you said this was your first first movie, correct? Or did you already do Roger Rabbit before? I know it was a short. But well, I did. I worked on Roger Rabbit the short, and then from a feature standpoint, I worked on The Rescuers Down Under, and and that was kind of a it's a, a, a hiccup in, in time because we, we were on it for several months, and and it really it, it bombed. I don't want to say bombed, but it didn't do well in the theaters. Yeah. And then we were on to Beauty and the Beast, and so that's when everything took off after that. Now, with Beauty and the Beast, what it, I just, I don't, the only reason I asked that and preface that is I don't like putting words in your mouth. Would you say you were really, really new and you were still, you know, like you said, trying to get your feet wet at this point, trying to get yeah. that, that paint wet? Um, what do you think, as far as that entire movie goes, Beauty and the Beast, what do you think was the hardest part of that entire, uh, that entire endeavor for you? For me, well, for me personally, it was, you know, understanding dramatic acting without overacting here. You got this big monstrous beast. That's complex. Personally, he's complex to look at. He's complex to draw. Everything about him is complex, but you know, some of the best animation I did of him was him just very pensive and barely moving and just taking a breath and, you know, learning how to hold back. That was, that was the biggest thing I learned is how much life you can get into a shot how much more life you can get into a shot by holding back and just really, you know, up to that point, and I was doing what a lot of young animators do is you start thinking about the choreography and it starts, you start to move things in the way that they speak and you don't move in the way that things really move and act and emote. And that it was during that time that I started really kind of putting myself into the, into the character and immersing myself and just letting it, play out and then re and then kind of recording myself not with a camera but just in my brain you know as I would do it and realizing how little 
I moved, but it was all, you know, expression and, and um, it's like, you know, playing really good blues, you know, really good blues music. You know, most of it is, it's the chords you don't play rather than the chords you play. And, you know, when you get in there and, and you, you leave out enough stuff and just leave the important stuff, then it really sings that much harder. I'm going to sidetrack for just a second. I'm assuming you're a big blues fan. Oh, yeah. You, uh, you know, Chris Stone, Kingfish Ingram? I know the name. I don't know the music. Man, I'm going to send you some shit that'll change your life. This dude is B.B. King reincarnate. He's like 22, 23 years old. Oh, is he the big dude? The big kid? Yes. Yes, I know him. Yes. Phenomenal, man. Like, yes, every, like I got I goosebumps. Yeah, I got goosebumps yeah. now thinking about it. But the man's so soulful. I, I, he's actually uh, playing in Orlando. I either just played in Orlando or he's playing in Orlando here in the next couple of weeks down at the uh, Amway. I think it's, no, it's the, um, fuck, Dr. Phillips Arena, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, cool shit where we are beauty and the beast that's where we're at um so with, with all that being said man and you're and you're getting through this glenn keen obviously what was the budget like specifically for fedex you remember that i mean obviously you're an animator oh animator. I, I, I have no idea but it was ridiculous i gotta imagine and then we did we had some of the first video conferencing too and at one point it was like literally like twenty thousand dollars a minute to do <laughs> so we hardly ever used it because they had it was insane how much it would cost. Um, what was the, the lag like? What's that? What was the lag like? Oh, it was horrible. And then, um, just the, it wasn't even the lag. It was just the connectivity. It, was, it, it sucked. Everything sucked. About it. it was just bad. And, uh, but we would use it, you know, every once in a while. Jeffrey Katzenberg was still part of the studio, and they would save it for Jeffrey meetings and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, the the – the FedEx budget, I have no clue. I have no clue. And, and I, I mean, I, when we were making Brother Bear, you know, we were, we were past all that stuff. And, uh, and I had 90 million to make Brother Bear and I didn't have to spend it on FedEx at all. So I don't know, I don't know what those other, other films were spending their money on. <laughs> that's, a, that's a shit ton of package, man. You guys kept FedEx. Disney built, that's the, that's the house that Disney built, FedEx. Is the house oh yeah, house. man. Big time. That's, that's phenomenal, man. Uh, now, I'm pretty sure you've been asked this a bunch of times, so we'll do a two-parter for this question. What sure. was your favorite scene that you animated, and what was your favorite scene that you didn't animate in Beauty and the Beast? Well, the scene, my favorite scene, obviously, was the one I just told, told you about. Yeah. Um, you know, the one where they, they're fighting back and forth. And there's some stuff, uh, you know, when he's leading her, when he's taking her to her room and they're walking down the hallway and he says, the, you know, the castle is your home now, so you can go anywhere you like. That whole sequence, I animated all of that, all the way up to where he takes her to the room and slams the door. So that was, all of that was a lot of fun to, to do. Um, there was, uh, but there was also interspersed within that, there was some shots that Glenn did that I wish I could have done. And, um, you know, we're screaming, you know, then I don't care, you can starve, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just thought it was really great. He just would get so big and broad. And, um, you know, I was just talking about, you know, I just spent five minutes talking about holding back and being subtle with your animation. But sometimes you just, you want to explode with it. And, it, and when you do, it makes it feel, you know, feel that much bigger. And, uh, and with a character like the Beast, it was so much fun to, to go really big with him. It was awesome. Now, is there a, I think I asked you this on one of your, uh, one of your live videos and you do what was the uh date and time again do you have a specific i know it's fridays but when do you do your live videos at 1 p.m eastern time 1 p.m eastern time on friday so ladies and gentlemen make sure you check that out yeah so uh, we'll also we'll also talk about your uh, website here just real quick too sure. uh creatureartteacher.com man so what if people go there what can i know you're running a sale right now so tell the people what can they yeah. do your website okay well let me back up a little bit so what happened was after i left disney i um I let me back up even further for that. I'll tell you why I left Disney. So I'll give you a whole whole history lesson. Um, after we made Brother Bear and they shut the studio down, I went out to California. Uh, I stayed with Disney. I was one of 10, 10 or 15 people that out of the Florida studio that was held on to. Everyone else had gotten laid off. And so I was very lucky. And uh, my wife and two kids at the time, we packed everything up and, and headed to California. And uh, I was contracted to, de to develop and, and direct another movie. And so we started developing films. And I started developing a film called King of the Elves, The King of the Elves. And it was a story by Philip K. Dick, who wrote 
Minority Report, Total Recall, Blade Runner. Uh, but he wrote this little 12 page fantasy piece. And it was about this old guy in, in Colorado that runs a gas station and these elves come up out of the woods one night and they, they're looking for shelter and they want him to be their king. And it's a really cool story. And we thought it could be really neat if we placed it in the South and gave it blues music and all kinds of really cool stuff. And Disney loved it. Uh, this By this point, we had uh, uh, John Lasseter was involved and, and Pixar had come in. And uh, so we really had a good role going. And so, I, but as we were making the film, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And, um, and we kept trying to make the film and, and, and get her taken. I kept trying to make sure she was getting taken care of and, but she was getting sicker and sicker. And it got to the point where I couldn't go to work anymore. And I needed to spend my time with her. And, and uh, Disney was great about, you know, letting us get set up at my home. I had a studio there and uh, we worked out of my home for quite a bit. So I could take care of her and feed her and, and, you know, nurse her and all that. But ultimately on, as a matter of fact, it was March 11th in 2007, uh, she passed away in my arms. And uh, I was devastated, completely, you know, completely devastated. And um, we, you know, I, 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 nothing mattered anymore. I didn't want to, I didn't care about animation. Uh, certainly didn't care about making a cartoon compared to what was happening in my life. My kids, you know, well, they were uh, 16 and 14 and uh, destroyed, you know, and so my life, my family was falling apart. And so I, um, I tried to go back to work, tried to work on this film. I tried for like a year and a half and it just wasn't working. And um, until finally John uh, took me off the film. And when they uh, when they took me off the film, that's when I realized I really needed to make a change. And uh, my whole life had just crumbled. My, I had lost my soulmate. And, you know, at, at the time, you know, there were, I always used to tell people there, there's really two things that identify me. It's my, my family and, and my job, animation, Disney. Those are the two things that really make up who I am. And, and both of them had fallen apart. And so when John took me off the film and basically said, you're not directing anymore, I said, you know, I got to read instantly. All this stuff happened in my brain. And I said, you know, I got to. I got to reinvent myself. I got to rediscover myself. I got to find who I am. And so I said, I quit. And, uh, and he goes, well, and I just celebrated my 21st year at the studio. And, um, and they go, whoa, 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 no, no, we don't want you to quit. And, and I said, no, no, no. And I, I said, look, there's no, there's no hard feelings. I said, if I was in your position, I would do the same thing. I said, I'm a mess, man. And uh, I don't know if I'm coming or going. I don't know. I, you know, I, need, to, I need to figure, figure my shit out. Yeah. And, uh, and so I thanked them, you know, for, for everything. I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't pull it together and, and uh, shook everyone's hands and went back to my office and started packing up. And I remember sitting there the next day and uh, packing up my office. And I had a message from somebody in Florida saying, Hey, Aaron, there's somebody you know, from somebody that didn't even know I had quit saying, Hey, if you're interested in coming back to Florida, there's someone they're, they're opening a studio and they need a director. I think, holy shit, okay. And so, uh, so I packed up everything, sold my house, and and uh, and I went to went to Florida, came back to Florida, my home, and I got involved with Digital Domain, which was opening a studio in Stewart, Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, making making movies there. And so uh, I was there for about two years, developed with, uh, along with my uh, producer partner who left Disney as well, um, several people that I knew uh, from Disney. Um, we developed four films. We were making one called The Legend of Tembo, which was an elephant film. And about three years into the project to come walking in to work one day and the doors are locked. The whole studio was shut down and, and gone bankrupt and wow. had no idea was, that it was happening. And so it all just fell apart again. And so that's when I went home and I, I sat down and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the studios. I just... I don't want to go back. If I'm really going to reinvent myself and find who I am, like I said I was going to do, then I'm really going to do that. And uh, and so I just I remember going out on my back porch, realizing I had to sell my house again, and uh, made a cup of coffee and started thinking, what do I want to do with my life? And I started thinking about just my old journey from the beginning, and you know the things my wife had been a part of, and and my friends and. And I want to do something that would make her proud too. I started thinking about Glenn. Glenn was such a big part of my life. 
and all the training and all the knowledge he had shared with me. And this is right at the beginning of YouTube and, and, and you know, the ability to, to share on a global scale through the internet. And I started thinking, holy shit, I can, I can do what, I can take what Glenn's shown. I can take the last 35 years of my career or 30 years at this point uh, of my career. And I can, I can start, you know, sharing it with people and, and teach them and they can go into their, their own careers with a little bit more knowledge than what I had. And so um, that's what started a uh, creature art teacher. I decided I wanted to start teaching and sharing everything that I'd learned. And the other big thing was I started seeing, you know, that the colleges, the pricing of colleges had gone through the roof, mm -hmm. um, art schools and that sort of thing. I mean, just insane. And, and I, and I, and I knew there, I know there's artists out there that are never going to be discovered, are never going to be able to hone their talent because they didn't have enough money to, to go to this school or that school or whatever. And so I made sure to, we, you know, I got together my, with a, a, my business partner, Nick Birch. And uh, I said, I want to do this. I want to, you know, we want to, I want to educate, make it all, you know, uh, reach out to as many people as we can. And I want to make sure the price point is low enough that anybody can do it. I don't care if they're in a low income country, I want them to be able to access our information and they can learn art. And, and what that's done for us, it's really opened us up to a much bigger global community because there's a lot more access to it. Um, and so it, it's worked out, you know, so many people come up to us and say, hey man, you're, you're undercutting yourself. You, have, you can make so much more money. And it's like, no, actually I think we're doing just fine because we've got, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world that are that are buying our content so it works great and uh, as a matter of fact i'm heading off next month to do some teaching in europe but um but that that little inspiration of thinking about glenn and what he had done for me and just realizing that i just remember i remember that one spark where i went oh shit i can put that on youtube <laughs> you know and and uh and that's where the whole thing started and um then we, we never looked back we, you know, our first year was a real struggle financially, and I picked up other jobs along the way. But after that, um, you know, the business kind of became self-sustaining, and and now we're at where we're at. So it's working pretty good. It's a beautiful story, man. It started out oh, you know, real sad, you know, losing losing that significant other, man. It, it I'm, I got to imagine it was the toughest time of. Well, your it's, 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 you know, there, one of the lectures that I give, I, I, there's a lecture that I give at, at different schools, just about my career and just, you know, talking about me, but, um, but it's one of the biggest things I learned is that, you know, you're going to, life's going to, life's going to come at you no matter what life is good. Life's bad. Life is just life. It's just, it is what it is. And uh, you're going to get slammed in the face and you're going to get lifted up and just depends on what day it is. And, but even a slam in the face can lead to something good. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it's the irony to me is, you know, it took the, the death of the one person I love more than anything else in the world, took her death to turn me in a direction that I never would have gone otherwise, you know? And because I'm, I'm in a place now from a career standpoint, I'm not directing movies. I've done that already though. I'm not animating, you know, for feature films. I've done that, but I, I'm still animating. I'm still drawing. I'm still teaching. And I'm literally happier from a career standpoint now than I've ever been. I, I, I work from home every day. And, 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 you know, if I want to paint, I'm going to paint. If I'm going to animate, I'm going to animate. If I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw. And it's just, and I, and I teach people how to do it along the way. And it's really an amazing feeling. And I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have gone that route had this tragedy not happened. So it's, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It really is, man. That's a beautiful story. And I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. Oh, uh, thanks. Now, as we, uh, as we start to, to wind down, I hope you had fun, man. I know the last little bit was a little. Was, was oh, no, it's all, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, so we couldn't hit everything in your career because, I mean, you said it yourself, man. You guys were hitting hit, 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 hit. <laughs> I mean, Ten, I tend to be long-winded too, so sorry about that. Uh, no, it, it, like I said, whenever you get a chance, just pick one episode and listen. I love. I'm a, I'm a chef by trade. We've talked food before, but uh, I, I love seeing. You know, no pun intended. I love seeing how the sausage is made, man. When you yeah. go deep cuts, and I can just sit back and 
oh, I don't have to talk. The fans don't tell me to shut up. I, I really enjoy it because I love hearing stories, man. We don't get to see yeah. every interview that I've ever really seen because I try to go and listen to a lot of yours. So I listened to yours. Uh, you were on there a couple times with the Bancroft Brothers, which they have a phenomenal podcast. If you haven't checked that one out, you guys are fans of animation. Bancroft Brothers, Bancroft, Jesus Christ, Brothers Animation Podcast is a phenomenal podcast to listen to. It um, is. I was their second one. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it, it's it's really cool just hearing hearing some of these deep cut stories because depending on who you're listening to and what you're listening to, you're gonna have the same. What was your favorite movie, Aaron? Oh, yeah. what, what did you like the most on the Beast? You know, so you don't really get to hear some of the stories you get to yeah. hear. You don't go off the reservation. Um, exactly. That it's it's. I have a brain that goes in a mild bit and bunch of different ways so it's, it's nice to see that uh somebody else is doing the same thing so fans questions man we had a bunch of them right in we'll get to as many as we can um malik we're gonna start out with the 90s for disney was referred to as disney renaissance as the studios received praise for its innovative and nostalgic approach in animation you were working in florida during the time did it ever feel like a renaissance we touched on that a little bit did you guys yeah. feel like you were on to something special during the time <laughs> See, for me, growing up, and I guess I didn't really, I didn't say this in the beginning, Disney was still magic. You know, to us growing up, um, it's different than it is now. Uh, it's hard to explain. It's just, it was just different. You know, being uh, kids of, you know, born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s and 80s, Disney never went away. It was always there. It was always magical. So the fact that we were working there was just, it didn't matter that it was a renaissance of film. We weren't thinking of it. We were just like, oh, my God, we're working at Disney. This is amazing. And we're making animation. Oh my God! You know, and and so it was that we never, and, and I was never really aware of the studio. We you know the studio came very close. You know, within within a hair's breadth of of being shut down before we came. You know, in, you know, in the late eighties, Eisner was going to shut it down, and it took uh, uh, Roy Disney uh, to come in and say, "Don't shut it down. Let let me have it. Turn it around." And uh, and so. We never knew all that. We, you know, at the time we learned about it later, but it was just the idea of being able to work there was just amazing. Yeah, it was cool. Um, without going too crazy, uh, you know, too crazy in the weeds here. Uh, what was the reason behind? Now, when you're talking to closing the studios, the Florida studios or the animation shutting studios? down animation altogether? Really? Was it just no, it was after the Black Cauldron? The Black Cauldron was a complete bomb. It sucked. It was horrible, and they just. It, I don't know what they were doing when they made that movie, but it was after that they were like, okay, this, you know, this is it. And, but it was, but um, he, you know, Michael had the, Eisner had the, the forethought to, or at least the, the, the capacity to look at Roy and, and, and trust him. And Roy came in and really helped turn it around. That's when they brought in Tom Schumacher and Peter Schneider and, you know, all these, all these Broadway guys that, that knew musicals and knew how to, um, you know, structure a movie in a different way. And that's really, that's where it started. You got any cool Roy Disney stories? Roy loved Brother Bear. He yeah. loved, he loved nature films, you know, back in the sixties, he, he was the one that was doing a lot of the Disney nature, mm -hmm. nature stories. And so, um, uh, he would come up and he would just sit with Bob and I as we, and Chuck, and just shoot the breeze. He'd be talking about taking his ship to his uh, his sailboat to Hawaii or living in his castle in Ireland or whatever. And they're like, oh yeah, I can relate, you know. And uh, <laughs> but he, you know, he, he was just he was a super super down to earth guy. Really really nice to nice to hang out with. And you know, he was and he loved the movie, so that was cool. Thank you. Uh, so this one's probably going to be pretty self-explanatory because you alluded to it earlier, but Sonny wants to know, why do some call you the creature teacher? <laughs> I love, my first love has always been drawing animals. From I could, from the time I could hold a pencil, um, I wanted to draw animals. And so uh, I've always run around out in the woods chasing animals, photographing them. That's always been my first, my first drive. And then, and, uh, and after, you know, college, it was, you know, I, first of all, backing up, I never wanted to be a Disney animator. That was never my intent. I wanted to be uh, an illustrator for National Geographic and a wildlife painter. And it wasn't until I realized I couldn't get a staff position that I thought, okay, what else is there? And Disney came along looking for interns. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of cool. And I got into, and I was able to get into Disney and, and uh, I met Glenn Keane and he turned everything around for me and, 
you know, right here we are 35 years later. But, um, but I still kept my love of animal drawing throughout all of that. And so, um, you know, whether it's animating them or, or teaching people how to draw them, I guess it's just kind of permeated, you know, throughout my career. You ever done a gorilla? On one yes. Yeah. Matter of fact, my intern walk cycle was a gorilla walking along. Yeah. 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 Uh, I got a little cooking, shameless plug here. I got a little cooking channel. I, I, I didn't used to do, I'm still trying to get back into it, but uh, 12 hour shifts, then two hour plus travels, one hour, one way, one hour, the other. Yeah. Plus, seven month old. It's kind of hard for me to get in the kitchen here when I'm getting my ass kicked in the kitchen all day. Um, <laughs> but I started the vanilla gorilla kitchen over uh, once COVID happened. Once they all told us to go home, and we didn't know when we were coming back. I was yeah. like, shit. you know, I don't want to, I didn't want to, take your beautiful story and then me shit on it with my, my horrible story, uh, <laughs> you know, but it was the same thing. Like I had so much that I wanted to say, right. There's nothing, yeah. I can't remember who said this, but there's nothing worse than being a creative person or artistic person, having so much to say and yet having nobody to say it to. And that's exactly. what it felt like during COVID once COVID happened with a lot of the people that were in the food industry, we had, yeah. you know, many hours and many blood, sweat and tears, just like you guys do with the animation field of just, banging dishes out man and nothing's more gratifying than seeing somebody smile at your dish that scene in ratatouille where fucking ego drops his fork after he tries what remy sends out that is something we all fucking chase yeah i'll exactly. tell you that right now that 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 resonates so deep with somebody that works in the industry if you yeah. get that you're like fuck dude i'm just gonna put my two weeks notice in because nothing <laughs> can get better but nonetheless man in march of 2020 i started the vanilla gorilla kitchen so like i said shameless plug man if you haven't done a gorilla yet i would love to see you do a gorilla like you did what was it uh, was it a cheetah the other day uh the painting oh yeah the leopard yeah the leopard excuse me I'll do, I'll do, yeah we should get together i'll do something for you beautiful man that was really pretty i showed my kid that because he's a big uh big cat fan and he was like holy yeah. shit. he didn't say holy shit but he was like oh shit so, <laughs> um, but uh here we go uh, uh moist <laughs> moist the lion wants to know there you uh, go yeah <laughs> what's your favorite modern animated movie or series and why um, anything Brad does, anything Brad Bird does is my favorite. So I love everything Brad Bird does. And, you know, I, I, uh, you know everyone loves uh, Iron Giant and, and, you know, both uh, the Incredibles films are just fantastic. Uh, Brad's ability to write character and write dialogue and create situations that are so fun, but also believable and real. Yeah. It's so hard to do. It is so impossibly hard to do. And he does it effortlessly. And it just blows my mind. And um, But there's other things that go into making those come off the way they do. It's the casting and, and being able to direct the actors in the way that you do to, to deliver the lines in the way that they need to be delivered. And, you know, there's so much more to it. And, it's, and he's just a master at it. So, yeah, anything that Brad does, I just love. Yeah, guys, a, a fucking genius. If, if we can't say yes. it, uh, this one's a fun one. Uh, what? Uh, there's a two part here. Uh, what are your favorite animals to draw, and are some animals more difficult to make expressive than others? If so, how do you work around this? So let's start with your favorite animal first. You got a favorite animal that you absolutely love to draw? Yeah, any big animals. I love drawing big animals. I love drawing big cats. I love drawing elephants, bears. You know, just big, massive, strong animals. I love drawing those. Um, and some animals are a little bit more complex than others. And so you might run into having some issues with, uh, expressiveness, but I've gotten to a point now where I don't, I don't really stumble through that. I mean, everything's hard. Don't get me wrong, but, um, I've just through experience and, and time, I've just figured out how to work through it a little bit better. One of the biggest things I, I, you know, one of the biggest lessons I, I, I learned early on was uh, you know the whole idea of comparative comparative anatomy that we basically we all have the same parts they're just shaped different ways yeah. and so once you understand that then you go okay I'm trying to draw this part of this lion it's not working right well oh it's that part on me and if I and I understand how it kind of flows through me and if I can get it to flow through the cat the same way then I can get that rhythm right and, and I, it sounds weird but it works yeah, and no. uh, um, and so that's kind of how I work through a lot of my my posing and and uh, and expressions and that sort of thing. Is there anything that gives you trouble to this day? Everything gives me trouble. I don't draw as well <laughs> as people think I do. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just don't give up. <laughs> Very tenacious. Um, 
<laughs> no, but I, you know, it's um, it's like anything else. If you practice at it enough, it 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 comes a little easier. You might still struggle at it, but you know, even a great baseball player, you know, has to concentrate to play baseball, but they're but they're damn good at it because they play it a lot. And oh, yeah. Art's the same way. You know, you can become a great artist, but the struggle never goes. Yeah, it's uh, we alluded it to it earlier. It's the ten thousand hour rule, man. Bruce yeah. said it. He'd, he'd rather be kicked by somebody that knows ten thousand different kicks than kicked by that one person that's done that one kick ten thousand times. Right. Exactly. Just to keep it on the page of animation. I can't remember who said it, but they were like, "You've got ten thousand bad drawings into you, so you might as well start now." Exactly. So, uh, average radiator thirteen wants to know. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but what advice can you give an aspiring animator? You know, it's be patient. And um, especially as an animator, be a student of people and life and um, really delve into your character, immerse yourself into your character and feel what they're feeling. Don't, don't animate what a character is doing. Animate what a character is thinking. Animate what a character is feeling. As soon as you just start animating what a character is doing, you're literally just going through the motions. But once you start animating what a character is feeling, then you're feeling it. Once you're animating what a character is thinking, you're thinking it. And all the movement comes out of what you're thinking. All the movement comes out of what you're feeling. And sometimes, like I was talking about earlier, there's no movement at all, and it screams the loudest. And other times, it, it'll move a lot. But all that movement is going to come from a place of honesty because you're feeling the emotion. Do not animate what a character is, is doing because then it just becomes hollow movement. Beautiful. Uh, I forgot to write this person's name down. So person, I apologize. Uh, if you could go back in time and animate any scene from any Disney movie, Pixar movie, uh, my handwriting is horrible. So Disney Pixar, uh, what scene would you select? Not because I think I could do it better, because I don't think anyone could have done it better. But back in Bambi, when we introduced the deer and uh, Bambi's mother and Bambi are walking through the forest and come walking out into the to the meadow, to me, that's just everything about that is real. I go out every day. Uh, I've got these my my fiance and I have these uh, electric bikes and we go out trail riding every day for like 20 miles out in the out in Wakiva Springs. And there's this lake that that's out there. And lately, because everything's starting to green up, we're, you know, I, we went out there tonight and there's like 25 deer out there. Yeah. And uh, and I watch them and I remember, I, I always think about Bambi because, you know, when the, there's only, a, I think, a four, seven year, four year gap between Snow White and Bambi. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the animals, the difference in the animation of the animals, it's like night and day. Because on Bambi, they really sat with the deer. They drew deer. They went out and watched them. They observed them. They looked at everything they did so that when they animated them, they were real deer. And, and that's, that, that I just love. And, um, and I feel that when I go out and I see these, these deer out on that. Matter of fact, I want to I wanna animate something from, from Wakaiba Park. I've got a little short idea that I want to do with the deer like that. And all inspired by that, you know, Tyrus Wong and all the rest of the guys from Bambi. So, yeah, I wish I could go back and, and do that. Uh, that'd be dope. I can't wait to see that, man. Um, <clears throat> here's the one I was telling you about earlier. Uh, Violet, uh, there are some really strong parallels between Mufasa and Jesus, Scar and the Devil. Was it deliberate? No. Uh, it was all Hamlet. Hamlet. So, yeah, everything, uh, Lion King was Hamlet. So, um, you know, when you look at just the iconic values of them. I mean, Mufasa is godly and, and good and, and Scar is evil and bad. So it's like black and white. It's like, okay, they, they match in that sense. But when you get down to the subtleties and everything, there's a lot of differences. And then you know, it's from a, from a story standpoint, it's, it's completely Hamlet. Who do you think is the greatest Disney villain of all time? In your opinion? Greatest Disney villain, uh, Maleficent's one of them. I love Maleficent. Uh, I don't know if the, just from a from a, a visual standpoint, and I don't even know if it's counted as a villain, but the the devil on the you know night on Bald Mountain with with uh, the devil coming up in Fantasia and stretching his wings and doing all that. I mean, that's that's just the best ever. And uh, 
That would have been a great Molly Hatchet album. <laughs> <laughs> My stepdad was a real big fan of Molly Hatchet. Or Meatloaf. Yeah, exactly. A yeah, bad out of hell. Yeah, he had all those oh. t-shirts with the cutoff sleeves, so... Yeah, but uh, I think Maleficent was probably my one of my favorite villains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that question was asked, and then a lot of people were Scar, 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 Scar scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. That Be Prepared song, and then you see the live oh, yeah. one that they did a few years ago. <laughs> see high steps and everything else. Yeah, yeah it was it was crazy. Um, Abyss, oh, I thought this said sandwich. Uh, Abyssal Shadows wants to know. Uh, any fun, interesting stories from the time working on Beauty and the Beast? You got any like uh, after work stories type of thing that you had you had fun with with Beauty and the Beast? Yeah. Oh my gosh, it was so far back, and uh, I mean, every day was a it was a it was a blast. I mean, one of the things that we did, you know, we would bust our ass every day working, doing hour after hour after hour, and every once in a while, and, and plus we were kids. I mean, we were 21, 22 years old. Um, you couldn't help but kind of break into having fun every once in a while. And so at least two, three times a week, um, the studio would disintegrate into a huge rubber band war. <laughs> and it would just be, you know, 30 people against 30 people fighting rubber bands. People get hit in the eye. I mean, just not safe at all. And, uh, yeah. and certain, you know, some people not into it at all and screaming at everybody. It was just, yeah, it was just crazy. And it happened all the time. I mean, rubber band wars at Disney Studio are just, I mean, it's, it, it's just, it, it, it goes together like us doing animation. You can't have the studio without the rubber band wars. And we got into huge ones. I mean, just giant ones. So that was, that was a lot of fun. And there, it was on every movie, not just Beauty and the Beast. It was every film. Yeah. Did, you guys pick, did you guys pick teams like high school dodgeball? I want him, I want him, I want her, I want her. Because it would just, it would just disintegrate into it. You know, somebody would get hit. And the rubber band would bounce off someone's head and land on someone else's desk. And that person would get up and shoot, shoot where they thought it came from. And next thing you know, it's just everybody firing on everybody, you know? So it, yeah, it just, it was never as, as clean as this side against that side. It was basically factions trying to, trying to you know, fight against this faction or that faction. Oh shit. I hit my mic. Uh, it's like that with me and my son in the, uh, in the house here with Nerf guns. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you think of the live action Beauty and the Beast? Uh, still from Bizzle Shadows. I, I, I thought it was okay. It's so weird, you know, having worked on the film and knowing the film so intimately. It's hard to watch the live action one without being, without just remembering. Oh, I animated that shot, and I think, you know, it, well that came out better or that came out worse. One of the things I hated, and I hate saying this because I don't like to badmouth anybody's films. But um, I really did not like the way they portrayed the beast. And, and, I, and I, I talked to some of the people that designed the character for the live action film. And, he, and they said they kept getting these notes back from the executives saying that, you know, he's not good looking enough. Well, he's not supposed to be. He's supposed to be a beast. He's supposed to be a monster. He's supposed to be ugly. And he was just he was just a hairy, good looking guy. And it was just that really bugged me because I wanted him to. I was really excited before I saw. What he was going to look like. I was really excited to see how they're going to take, you know, that design and interpret it into 3D. And I just went, oh, that was that. <laughs> underwhelmed. Yeah. yeah, I was underwhelmed. I was bummed. Now, the last one from her or him, excuse me. I, was, I apologize. Uh, how well do you believe your film stands up after 30 years or after 30 years or, yeah, stands up 30 years later, excuse me? Brother Bear? No, no. Um, Beauty and the Beast. It was the same Beauty. And the, it, she had a whole her heat. Excuse oh, me. Oh, oh, Beauty, oh, Beauty and the Beast stands up. I, it, it's timeless. Yeah, it'll continue to be timeless. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And it's funny because I think Beauty and the Beast uh, artistically is one of the worst films we did. Um, there's no consistency to character look. You, you know, there's we always talked about. There's like five different bells in the movie. There's three or four different beasts. You know, but the story is so strong. Um, people overlook that. And it, it, it really, it, it'll always hold up. Definitely. Well, shit, I'm going to have to go back and re I haven't watched it since last year. I'm going to go back and rewatch and see if I can point it oh, out. Oh, yeah. The, the, the character models change all over the place. You're going to yeah. have some angry nerds writing into you. You know that? <laughs> okay, I'm no. my childhood. Uh, <laughs> Transient Mirage wants to know. 
Um, oh, this is a really good one. I really, I really like this one. I should ask this one first. Uh, do you think Disney will ever do another traditional 2D animated film? No, uh, never say never. Um, and actually, actually, I take that back because of because content is getting changed so drastically different now uh, with you know the streaming platforms and everything else, and less people going in the theaters and just the way content is consumed. <clears throat> and Disney, for as much of a trendsetter as they are, they also tend to be a follower. And I think Netflix, uh, among others, is really setting the trend um, for creating animated content. Yes. Um, uh, from not just from a variety of, of styles, but they're going into 2D. They're going into, uh, but the storytelling is, is, is changing as well. So, um, I think if we can, if they can come up with a film that's not a huge financial risk, meaning if they can uh, get a studio that can do a 2D animated film for 40 million or less, maybe that's even more than, uh, maybe 30 million or less, even 20 million or less, then I think, uh, then they would definitely do it. And I think, you know, you look at studios like Cartoon Saloon that did Wolf Walkers and, um, and uh, Song of the Sea and, and, uh, and Secret of the Kells, um, you know, they're making full length animated features 2D for, you know, 10, 15 million dollars. I think they made the other ones even less than that, I think for 8 million. And they're Oscar nominated films. So there's no reason why we can't be doing 2D animated films out of budget. They certainly don't have to be 120, 150 million is what we were doing before, which is absolutely crazy. Um, so, uh, my first initial knee-jerk answer was no, and then I think it, it maybe yes, maybe. <laughs> That's where that budget was going to to FedEx, man. It was going into that hundred and fifty. Yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah. Um, two more here, and then we'll and we'll wrap it up. Uh, oh yeah, blue <laughs> blueberry waffle bacon wants to know. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, he did his. They don't have a question. They just want to say, you're my idol. I've bought and downloaded many of your uh, multiple classes from you. Um, so they said, thank you for that. Uh, what exercises do you recommend for beginners? I'm already familiar with the bouncing ball exercise, but what other exercises are there for other principles of animation? Just anything that, just get in there and start acting. Um, one of the things I love to do um, is just grab lines from movies, great pieces of dialogue, and just animate them. Come up with your own character. I didn't, you know, I, I, there's a, I took a line from Lebowski and animated a sloth, a sloth, a sloth, a sloth, you know, as Lebowski. And I just thought it was a lot of fun. And so, um, you know, doing that kind of thing, you learn a lot and, and it's fun. So you don't get bored. And uh, so, you know, I, I would just, just make sure you're doing care, doing some, character-based animation because that's where that's where it's at and uh um the more you do it the better you the better you'll get at it so you know everyone wants to do these exercises in order to do this or that the best exercise is to you know get in there and struggle with it and work it out and figure it out and just do it if you were to redraw this isn't a question this is just me going off the cuff here if you were to take what the advice you just give take a line from a favorite movie or a movie and animate it if you were to do the opening scene to Goodfellas where he's going in there and he's explaining every gangster, there's Tommy two times, there's this, there's that, what animal are you using? I don't know why, but the first thing I thought of was like the penguins from Roger Rabbit. Yeah. I, well, first of all, I was going to say that they'd have to be animals. So I'm glad you said that beyond that. I don't know. I, I gotta, I gotta sit down and, and figure out pe penguins. Pen, I, I actually, I would probably say no to penguins only because of Madagascar. <laughs> and uh, and the penguins there because they're already like that, and so I want to back away and and, and that's the right movie, right? Is it? Is it is yeah, 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 yeah. They got a TV show and a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, but I'd have to sit down and, and think about it. Um, I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, man. Well, this is this. That's not the only thing that was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate your time, Aaron. It's. Uh, I'm glad we finally got to do it. It took a it took a few fucking <laughs> minutes, man. But I'm, for, I'm you, yeah, for the folks listening, you have no idea. The yeah. first time I well, was it the first time I no the first time I had COVID. Yeah. And I uh, couldn't do it. The next time I just completely brain farted it and forgot. <laughs> I left you hanging. And then uh, then you've had problems. I've had it's just been a mess. It's been yeah, a mess. It really has. And this is this but we is survived and we got through it. And 
Yeah, this is the universe. One. Yeah, it's been a welcome distraction. I really appreciate it. If I can uh, recommend two things to you, I don't know if you're a, uh, if you're still watching animation. I got to imagine you are being a fan and being somebody that works in the industry. But if you have not checked out, we talked two D animation just a minute ago. If you haven't checked out Cuphead on uh, uh, Netflix, phenomenal show. A little throwback. I Wait, have it. I love it. Yeah, and then the other one uh, from one of my favorite creators of all time, Jorge Gutierrez, Maya and the Three. If you want to fucking cry. Yep. Go on because it'll make you cry. Yep. And I, I know Jorge, and uh, yes, and uh, it's awesome. Yeah, I had him on last week. It was a real, real honor. Uh, he's a so great dude. He's he such really, a cool guy. He really is. And he's got some of the greatest stories I've ever heard. Uh, you no. Know, is there anything that uh, we didn't talk about that you'd like to push some traffic towards? I mean, we talked about your uh, website. You're going on a vacation, or not a vacation, excuse me. You're going on a work trip here very, very soon. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that uh, you might be working on that you could uh, allude to the fans might? You know, I've, I've got, you know, I've got some little projects here and there, but those will come out as we go. Yeah, just go on over to creatureartteacher.com and, and see what we've got. I've got a lot of um, great lessons. And if you're looking for free content, check out my YouTube channel. It's uh, YouTube. Uh, I think it's Aaron Blaze Art. I think all my social media is that, um, or the art of Aaron Blaze. Aaron Blaze art. I think it's Aaron yeah, Blaze the art. Art of Aaron Blaze, yeah. And uh, uh, I've got hundreds of videos on there, and so go check all that out. And um, and I've got you know I've got some you know just watch our, our website uh, and, and come to our you know check us out every Friday for our live stream because um, we've got some upcoming workshop opportunities and things that we're going to be doing that I think. Uh, um, people might be interested in. So we're going to be doing some stuff here in Florida. We're going to be doing a workshop in Austria uh, in a couple of months. So we're going to be bopping all over the planet doing some stuff. So stay tuned. Beautiful. And all those links will be posted down below. Uh, the creatureartteacher.com, his website for YouTube, and anything else that uh, we might want to put in there for Aaron. Aaron, like I said, it's been a real blast, man. He's been Aaron. I've been Julian. It's been a What's In My Head podcast. And it's been another piece of your childhood. Good night.